Okay, we're now going to solve the second class of least squares problem. Um, and just um, like before, we're going to build all of our intuition for, from the ve vector matrix case. But when we look at an example um, to do with uh, optimal state estimation, uh, again, we'll be looking at a generalization of this um, where we allow uh, one of our vectors to be replaced by a function instead. Um, but let's just uh, set up what we're trying to solve. And this is sort of covering the scenario that was missed by the, the previous least, least squares problem. So once again, we're given a vector y and an m by n matrix A. Um, but this time, we're considering the case when the matrix A is very tall and very thin. So in our first class of problem, the matrix A was short and fat, meaning we had lots of solutions to the equation y is equal to ax. This time it's very tall and thin, and we will have probably no solutions to the equation y is equal to ax. So yeah, tall and thin, um, and for simplicity again, we'll just say that the, the matrix A has full rank, which uh, because it's tall and thin, m is greater than or equal to n, and so the rank is n in this case. So we have n independent um, columns, the matrix A could be very, very tall, um, and it's certainly not short and fat. And so we don't have many or any solution. Yeah, we're, we're unlikely to have any solutions to the equation y is equal to ax. So instead, we're going to try and come up with the value of x which is closest to solving y is equal to ax, and closest in terms of the this norm again. So the problem is to try to find the value of x that minimizes the difference between y and ax. So if we just think about what this all means again, so let's just remind ourselves this norm, this is just fancy notation for the inner product squared. So this, if we have some vector z inside this norm squared, this is just equal to the first element squared plus the second element squared plus the third, fourth, so on, up to, say, the nth. Um, so just all of the elements in the vector, square them and sum them. And now suppose that there was a value of x that solved y is equal to ax. Well, now we would just pick that value, and then this here would be equal to zero. And that's as small as we can make this. This is always greater than or equal to zero. But in general, there will be no solution, and we're just trying to pick the one that makes the difference between y and ax as small as possible. And if you've seen least squares pro problems before, this is probably the class of least squares problem that you've come across. This is the one that comes up in like regression problems. So suppose we have a bunch of data, and we want to come up with a line of best fit. Um, well, the line of best fit is parameterized by, say, two numbers, the slope of the line and where it um, crosses the y-axis. So our vector x consists of the slope and the crossing, and we want to pick the best value of the slope and the best value of the crossing. And how do we do that? Well, we compare what the slope and crossing would predict um, in terms of the measurements to the actual set of measurements that we get. We get tons and tons of measurements, so we get a long vector y. We get a lot of predictions for based on the slope and the crossing, and that's all captured by this matrix A. And then we just try to pick the values of the parameters, so that the, such that the difference between the data and the predictions is as small as possible. And maybe now you can already start to see the relevance of this kind of thing for observer problems. In the observer problem, we have some measurements subject to noise, but we want to make some estimate about the state. Um, and so, yeah, maybe it's not so surprising that there's going to be a least squares problem buried in all of this. So this is the least squares problem that we would like to solve. And once again, the bottom line is this least squares problem has an analytical solution. And what is the analytical solution? Well, it looks pretty similar to the least norm least squares problem solution that we saw before, but things are just shuffled around a bit. Um, and so we actually have A transpose A inverse A transpose Y. So this is our analytical solution to the least squares problem. And this is the thing to remember. So if you want to find the optimal parameters or 
the optimal guess for the state or whatever your problem is. Um, if you define optimal in terms of these two norms or inner products, um, then you get an analytical solution that can be written like this. So what's the intuition here? Well, let's draw a picture and let's assume, and this time we're going to plot the output. So let's, uh, let's suppose that our output y has got two dimensions. And we're in the situation where the matrix is tall and thin, so we have one so x is one dimensional and y is two dimensional or m is two and n is one. So if that's the case then the matrix A is two by one and so all the possible values of A x for different choices of x if this is the vector say this is the vector A in this case so the matrix just happens to be a vector in this case all A x will always correspond to a point on this line somewhere. And what is y? Well, y is just some point in these coordinates. So say that y is this vector here. Which value of x should we pick? So different values of x just pick different points along this line. And so we want to pick the value that gets us as close to po as possible to y. And once again, we get that by drawing a right angle, a line out here at right angles to our um, sort of the the, spa, the column space of um, the matrix A. So this is our optimal solution, x star, um, and x star is also given by this formula. So now we'll just derive this and also indicate how we can sort of capture this orthogonality condition um, and. The key thing to observe here is, uh, so what's, what's this direction? Well, this vector here, this is a x, or a x star is this vector here, um, and y is this vector here, so a x star minus y. So ax star minus y corresponds to this line here. So we want our condition for having found the optimal x star is that we want ax star minus y. We want this to be orthogonal to ax minus x star. So ax minus x star is just this vector here. So ax minus x star. We don't actually have to use x minus x star, we could just use x, but you'll see why we pick this. Um, so our, our optimality condition is that ax minus x star is orthogonal to ax star minus y. And so what does this correspond to? This corresponds to the inner product between these two vectors being zero. And so hopefully if this x star is optimal, we'll get that this, the inner product between these two things is zero. And that should, intuitively, that should tell us that that's the optimal solution. And then we'll, just like last time, we'll just verify that to, or kind of prove that to just make things, make ourselves absolutely certain. So here, yeah, just like last time, um, we start with a x minus x star, all transposed, multiplied by a x star minus y. Um, now let's multiply that out. So let's actually, yeah, let's do it in stages. So x x x minus x star transpose, and then so if I transpose all of this, I get this and then multiply by a transpose, and then multiply by this. But I can pull this a transpose in, and I'll get a transpose a x star minus a transpose y. 
And now hopefully you can already see where this is going. Um, so this is equal to A transpose A and then X star minus um, A transpose A to the minus one. A transpose Y um, all multiplied by X minus X star, and this is just zero. This is precisely our optimal solution, X star. So we've verified this orthogonality condition. And so the final thing, I mean, we have already shown what we want to show, but let's just really convince ourselves by showing that this must be the minimizer of this expression. So given, just like last time, we'll just add things and subtract things away. So a x minus y squared. So this is the thing that we want to minimize. I just swapped it around for, I, I didn't realize I'd done that, but it doesn't matter. Um, and then this is equal to a x minus x star plus a x star minus y. So here we see uh, we've just added and subtracted X, a x star. So these two things are equal to each other. Um, and then just like last time, if we multiply this out and we use this property here, we will see that this is equal to the norm of a x minus x star squared plus the norm of a x star minus y squared. So just like last time, we write this as this vector transposed multiplied by itself. We multiply everything out, but the cross terms will all equal to zero, and these are just the... So this is the this transpose multiplied by itself. This is this one is this transpose multiplied by itself. And then the cross terms equal to zero by this calculation here. And then we see that this is greater than the norm of a x star minus y squared. So this term here is always strictly bigger than zero unless x is equal to x star. And this actually follows from this rank condition here. Um, so this is a little less obvious than in the previous least squares case, but this term here is always positive unless x is equal to x star. And so in order to minimize this term here, we should pick x is equal to x star. Any other choice of x will always give us something bigger than what we would get with x equal to x star. So there we have our second type of least squares problem. The solution looks almost exactly the same, just things have been shuffled a little bit. Um, uh, this object is still called the pseudo-inverse. Um, yeah, in fact, um, was still equal to the pseudo inverse in this case, and in the case that we don't have rank n, we can put the pseudo inverse in here, and we'll um, we'll get the solution in the even more general case. Um, and yeah, now let's uh, do an optimal control example using this least squares problem.